we get started, I'll go ahead and obviously introduce Deb, the Director of Professional Development, uh, who is in today and uh, will help uh, with answering questions and fielding the expectations that we have for you guys going forward. And also we have Shiloh Modisette, our Program Manager. Uh, she will actually be managing the meeting itself for today. Um, and so we just want to thank you for participating uh, in this event. Our goal is to basically cover our two major agreements that we have called the co-sponsorship agreement and also the instructor agreement. Identify this basic premise of what is in that agreement, what has always been in that agreement, but then also some new changes as well. Uh, to give you a couple of brief updates regarding the this experience, this is an actual webinar instead of a meeting instance, which means the only three people that can actually be seen right this minute are me and Deb and Shiloh. In addition to that, we're the only three that can actually be physically heard. Uh, we do, however, want to make sure that uh, you guys have a voice. And so if you have any kind of questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Shiloh is going to be moderating the chat. And as we go along, if there's something that's very prevalent, then we might address it at that time. But we will have a time for Q&A at the end, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page as we're moving forward. That's our whole goal, is that as we're working as a cumulative collaborative provider for offering education throughout Texas, we want to get co-sponsoring entities well, the structures together so that we know the expectations of each other going forward, especially for 2021. The primary reason why we wanted to have this event in the first place is because really we just recognize that life has changed a little bit over the past few months. Uh, in all reality, especially because of COVID and remote learning and virtual learning that's happening more prevalently, the world has just simply gotten a lot smaller. And uh, while there used to be autonomy uh, with local associations, and while that's still true, uh, we also see a lot of cross-pollination of uh, members taking classes in different places, and there's a lot of differentiation in the way that classes are handled. And ultimately, when things are through our provider, there needs to be at least a minimum baseline of things that are consistent and the same across the way. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we recognize that there's some operational changes that we just needed to address in the co-sponsorship agreement. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, really the Remote classes bring a new and unique experience that, yes, is very comparable in concept to a live classroom course with its in-person, but there's enough differences that we just needed to address those changes just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all looking at the same rule book uh, when we're offering classes going forward. Uh, but then also, we found that the Real Estate Commission, as I'm sure many of you know, they have an enforcement division now, and so they're actually coming out and enforcing the rules that they have in place. Now, thankfully, they're actually going through and they're providing clarification on what those rules actually mean. And then they're really gonna start enforcing it. But we'd rather go ahead and be compliant while we can. Once we know the information and once we've learned from the commission what they expect, our goal is to disseminate that information and to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all speaking and, and teaching with one accord as far as uh, what is expected, not only from the commission, but also from us as a provider for co-sponsoring entities and also for the instructors. So that's the whole premise of having this meeting today. So uh, really, we would just wanna kind of go through the difference between the two documents really fast. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a co-sponsoring, co-sponsorship co agreement, and there's an instructor agreement. Simply put, the co-sponsor agreement is for entities, namely associations, but can also be instructors, that is our partner in offering classes for course logistics and administration. They're the ones that are scheduling the class. They're the ones that are handling the registrations. They're the ones that are making sure the truck rules are in compliance, that the uh, participants are uh, getting credit appropriately for their participation or lack thereof. Um, they, they're, they're, they're handling the class logistics. They schedule the class date, the time, the instructor, manage the breaks, any sponsors for any food if you're having an in-person experience, they do the logistics. An instructor agreement is the expectation of classroom management itself. Uh, what is okay and not okay in the actual class as an instructor. So sometimes you see uh, co-sponsoring uh, entities that are also instructors or instructors that also have a co-sponsorship agreement. So sometimes you do wear both hats that can happen upon occasion uh, on both sides, uh, but ultimately you have to know which hat or both that you're currently wearing and what we expect of you during that time. So with that, I just wanna kind of go over what a co-sponsorship agreement is what is in it and the basic highlights of, we, uh, of the agreement. It's about three or four pages long. We definitely recommend you read it. Don't do like I would do like for anything if I have a, an iPhone and it has like some kind of license agreement for Apple that I just say yes and I move on. Please don't do that. Please read this because there's stuff in there that we do expect of you and we do, are looking for from you and also things that you're looking for from us. So please make sure you read it. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. That's why we're here. So let's see. Co-sponsoring agreement or co-sponsoring simply 
is uh, when you're uh, partnering with us to offer classes through our provider and the logistics thereof. So you're going to do some of the course logistics. We're going to do some of the course logistics in compliance with the truck rules. And then it can also be an association staff or an instructor. But it's basically logistics. Uh, some of the expectations let's see, that we have is we need you to tell us when classes are coming and we want you to put them into carts. The reason why, even if it's a future class and even if for right now you don't see that future class in cart, we need you to tell us because the cart is actually designed to make sure that the class is actually approved and the instructor is eligible to teach the class for the time in which you were trying to schedule the course. Uh, I, that's actually the reason why I was created in the first place is because people would look on our um, uh, instructor course search and they would see a class and they would say, I want to offer this course. And then they would schedule a year later and the course would actually expire before that time. And that's not okay. We want to make sure the courses are actually approved in time uh, to for your classes. So please make sure as a co-sponsoring entity that you're putting your classes into cart. Uh, we also, uh, the co-sponsoring entity is going to advertise the classes. Uh, we need to make sure that you're compliant with our expectations as well as the real estate commission rules. Uh, we, you're going to be registering the attendees for the classes. Uh, for qualifying courses or essay courses, you need to make sure that you're administering or showing the course policies so that way they know what is expected of them, the rules and fines and fees and all that good stuff that's involved. Uh, you need to make sure and show that to them. Just as an FYI, it's in the monitor guidelines that's up on our website. Um, the registering, let's see, checking the photo ID, uh, we will uh, show you new mechanisms to do that going forward once they're ready. But ultimately, your job as a co-sponsorship, uh, co-sponsoring entity is to check the photo ID of the people that are coming into the class and to track attendance. Um, you get to start and determine the start and end times of the classes. Uh, you can, let's see, you also have to administer the course policies. So this is a, a, a big one for us. We have to, we try to set the minimum expectation of the lowest common denominator across the board, across Texas. So really we have exactly three things that we expect to be in any course policies. Uh, no distractions, no disruptions, but then also we've added one called no driving and we'll talk about that one in a second. Uh, and also why we try and keep it down to a minimum as far as that's concerned. But really you're gonna be administering those course policies. The people are who they say they are, that they're there for the duration of the class, you're handling the logistics of the course, and then also making sure that people are not distracting or disruptive. Um, if there is a potential infraction, we're just simply gonna ask uh, that you call them out. You physically call them or chat with them to identify, hey, look, this is what we see. Seek to understand, you know, uh, to clarify, to make sure that it is what you think is going on. Uh, if it happens the second time, you physically call them out, say you can't do that anymore. Um, and the third one, you get rid of them because if you allow people to stay in the class after they've been non-compliant, then it's, everybody sees it and it becomes distracting and disruptive for everybody else. And everybody else thinks that it's okay uh, to act that way. And we don't want that kind of a standard for courses through our provider. We wanna make sure that everybody understands the expectation for them and that we're consistent across the board. And ultimately, if you have any questions about the course policies, if you have any questions about um, the expectations that we have of you, please know we're always here. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to us at any time. Um, and to ask questions or to seek for clarification because that's that's why we're here. It's just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're offering things in a consistent way. So I want to share with you something really quick. I'm assuming everybody can see my screen at this point. And it helps if I click on the presentation to move forward. So really just to recap, um, this is what we're looking for as the new stuff uh, when it comes to 2021 uh, and going forward from there. Uh, we want to make sure that before, yes, we want you to sign the co-sponsorship agreement that we're going to be sending out soon in the next couple of weeks where you gain finalization from our legal department. Uh, we want you to sign that as co-sponsoring entities. And these are the three major things that we want to make sure you understand. Um, advertising, we got to see that before you uh, offer your first course in January of 20, me, in January of 2021. Uh, and really what, what constitutes advertising for us, I fully recognize, and I think we all do, Advertising comes in all kinds of shapes, forms, and fashions. And so you can have things on social media. You can have a verbal conversation with somebody. You could post it uh, uh, on a website. Uh, you can have a physical flyer that you're handing out. So we recognize that there's a variety of different platforms. And we're not expecting all five of these things on every single advertisement out there. So what we really are looking for is at the point of registration, when the rubber meets the road, that somebody says, I want to take this class. That is where we want to make sure 
that all five of these things are listed. You have to have the provider name, which for us is Texas Realtors. You have to have the provider number. It's 0001 or 4520, depending on if it's a qualifying course or a CE course. Uh, we have uh, the course name and the course number, and we also have the refund cancellation policy. Even if there are no refunds for the class, they still say no refunds for the class. You have to identify what the refund cancellation policy is. So those are the advertising rules. Those five things have to be at the point of registration or they have to see it before they get to the registration and you have to make sure that they've seen it. So that's definitely number one. The second thing that we've also added into our uh, rules as far as course policies are concerned, we always have had no distractions and no disruptions. And that can be any number of different things, but those are terms directly from the Real Estate Commission on what they're looking for. The one additional thing that we've added because of this year is simply no driving. Uh, you cannot drive legally and participate in the class. And so that's just a nightmare of a legal lawsuit potential that we just don't want to deal with. And it's just not safe. And obviously they're not paying attention. Now, keep in mind, our goal is to keep our limitations at a minimum fully recognizing that you can add to those and so if you have additional rules or you want to clarify and make them even more strict than what we have done, you are welcome to do so. And we will support the decisions that you make at your association in offering those additional uh, criteria, as long as they're clearly articulated before the class begins so that we people know what is expected of them. So, and they're also not in contradiction to ours. So if you contradict no driving, no distractions, no disruptions, then we won't honor that. But anything else, we will fully support and enforce that. Uh, in addition to that, we did change uh, monitor guidelines is a term we've been using since the dawn of time and we realize that that's not fair to call it that because they're not guidelines. We expect you to follow them. <laughs> they're not open for suggestions. Uh, we want to make sure that you're actually in compliance with what is in that document. So we've actually changed it to proctor policies uh, and they're uh, basically people who are going to be proctoring classes, uh, whether it is remote or in person, they're actually handling the logistics of the class during the class. It has a step-by-step -step expectation across the board of what we need or want from you both for CE and for qualifying courses. You can definitely look at that. Uh, definitely ask any questions because we want to make sure that you guys understand and we're on the same page with that. And that the, just so you know, this has always been in the co-sponsorship agreement, but we are actually enforcing it this next year. The consistent non-compliance is going to have some fines because our provider is at stake. And if we're not following the rules, we could lose our provider, which has a huge impact on the state of Texas uh, because obviously a number of associations and instructors alike use our provider. We don't want that to be in jeopardy. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're speaking the same accord. So those are the three major categories of co-sponsorship agreement. And I'm going to pause for a quick second. And Shiloh, do we have any kind of questions that we need to address at this time? Uh, yeah, a couple. So the first question is about um, whether participants are riding versus driving. So passengers and not driving. Uh, that's the first question. Okay, so our, our stance at this moment is the, the only three things that we are going to enforce on a consistent basis across the board across Texas is driving distractions and disruptions. Only because we recognize there might be times and circumstances where riding might be an acceptable experience. And so uh, because of that, we're not going to enforce that at this time on the state level across the board. However, at your local association, if that works for you and that is something you want to use, you are welcome to do so. And so, but at this time, we can identify a couple of circumstances to a point where if because there is at least one exception, then we don't want to put it on this list. The ones we have on this list are no exceptions across the board. Okay, and then the next question, um, just for clarification, where does the money for uh, the fines for non-compliance, where does that go to? Is it the association or sponsoring class or the um, or to Texas Realtors? It, so because the co-sponsorship agreement is actually the co-sponsoring between a co-sponsoring entity like a local association and then us at Texas Realtors, if the co-sponsorship agreement is not in compliance with the local association, then the money will come to Texas Realtors. And then the next question, um, are instructors required to have a proctor? Officially, it is suggested and recommended that you do have a proctor. It is better for the class to have a proctor. It is required in a remote environment for over 20 attendees with any class, you have to have a proctor that is not the instructor. 
if you were a sole instructor and you're offering classes and it's a small class of under 20 people, then we can understand that the instructor can also be the proctor because the class is small enough. But anything over 20 people, it is expected by the Real Estate Commission that you would have a proctor that is not you as the instructor. And we're using um, proctor and monitor. We're now switching to proctor. Um, but the, they are the same thing in terms of what you are thinking of. Um, next question. So can I, I, while you're looking it up, I will share with you the reason why we're changing to the term proctor is because when we started telling uh, in instructors and also association staff, whenever you're offering a remote class and you need a second monitor for over 20 people, it is very easily misunderstood that we mean a second physical monitor for a class, as in the screen that you're looking at or screens that you're looking at. And so therefore we're changing the term to proctor for that reason, but yeah, you're right. It's exactly the same. You know, you're monitoring the course. It's no, we're just not talking about the screens. That's the whole thing. Um, related to uh, the, the proctor policies, uh, when will the proctor policies be enforced? The, officially January 1st. We're going to have them posted before then. Uh, everything we're talking about right now, we're looking at for January 1st with an expectation that people are implementing it now. And so if we see it, we can address it way before there's any kind of an issue ahead of time that you're not surprised or blindsided by the expectations. We have to get them posted. I, I don't that, I try to posted. Okay, so yeah, they're already posted on our course administration page. Uh, we will make sure and send it out the Education Insider, the faculty post. We can make sure that they're on the Facebook groups. Um, so just so you know, as an aside, our primary conduit of information are these, is something called an Education Insider. It's for association staff or people who have co-sponsored with us. We have something else called a faculty post. It's the same kind of content, except for it's for faculty, as opposed to for uh, association staff. Uh, we highly recommend you make sure you're getting those. If you're not, let us know. In addition to that, we have Facebook groups. One is for association staff, and one is also for uh, instructors. If you're not a part of those, let us know and we'll send you the link so that you guys can join. It's a closed groups uh, that way you can collaborate and communicate with each other about best practices, uh, collaboration on uh, teaching techniques, logistics, whatever it might be. So as an aside, we recommend making sure you're a part of those two uh, groups, uh, respectively, depending on whatever you're a part of as far as instructor or co-sponsoring entity. But um, those two things are our primary conduit of communication. But going back to the point, we're putting it up there now. We're truly enforcing it January 1st, but we might address it between now and then, but we'll enforce it January 1st. All right. Uh, we have a couple more questions about proctoring. Um, I'm not ignoring your questions that are not related to proctoring. Don't worry. Um, can a student be assigned as a proctor? Technically, yes. Anybody can be a proctor at the end of the day. And so we don't have any specific guidelines as far as our expectations, as far as who a proctor is, as long as they understand what is expected of them and they're in compliance. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. We recognize that there are times and circumstances, certain circumstances where maybe using a, a student is not acceptable. Uh, they might have a vested interest in looking out for their friends, uh, whatever it might be. So we, we, don't, we don't want to recommend that necessarily use your best judgment, uh, just like whenever you're using an instructor as opposed to another class monitor uh, for uh, being a proctor. So use your best judgment in that. But yeah, anybody technically can be a proctor as long as they're compliant with our proctor policies and that they're doing what you're asking them to do as far as your co-sponsorship agreement components. And then um, do we need to rename ourselves in classes as proctor-association name? If you're in a broadcast experience and the instructor knows who you are, I would just go with whatever the instructor says. I mean, if, if I were a teacher in a class, I'm pretty sure I know most of the proctors that are out there, so you don't even have to name yourself. And so I know who you are. And so it, 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 that's not necessarily an expected guideline at this time. If you're referencing that one document that's up on our website on the course administration page, we are going to address that as well and clearly articulate what we expect of you uh, for classes going forward. Now that we have the proctor policies in place, that's our next step is to look at specifically broadcast courses that are through our provider that we're sending out to classes or associations across Texas. We're gonna look at that. It is not comprehensive yet, and we will let you know when it is. Um, and then I think this is maybe the last question about proctoring. Um, sorry, to clarify, the proctor is required if there are more than 20 people remote or also in person. And then also, what if there is a remote group and a proctor monitoring that group? 
So 20 is a magic number. So anything over 20, it doesn't matter if it's in person or remote. You, you would, you're going to want to logistically in an in-person experience, you're going to want a proctor for anybody over 20 period. Now you're required for 20 remotes that is required. That's not, that's non-negotiable. So if you have 10 person, 10 people in person and 10 people remote, we recommend uh, having a proctor because somebody's going to want to manage the class logistics. The instructor trying to toggle between the two, that's, that's a song and a dance. So that's pretty impressive if you can do it. And I would suggest that that's probably not the highest and best use of their time. Uh, instructors are intended to be the talent to come in to teach, not the class logistics, if at all possible. And so I'd recommend that uh, you have a proctor given any opportunity. But if the class is small enough, it's not something to, you know, break, break your back over. You know, the instructor can technically do both on a small uh, circuit. Um, and then the proctor does not need to be visible on screen, correct? So officially, since they're not getting credit, it is not required. The instructor, the proctors are not visible on screen, but I would definitely recommend that you communicate with the instructor as to what is expected of you and also know your audience too. I do know that there are uh, some members out there that really like and appreciate being able to see the proctor, uh, to be able to communicate with them, not just by text, but also by seeing you upon occasion. I mean, you can think about it like this. Uh, if you have an in-person class, uh, I might not sit in the class all the time, but I'm gonna be coming in fairly frequently. They're gonna know who I am, that I'm the proctor as I'm coming in and I'm monitoring to ensure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that uh, if you have your camera turn, turn off literally the entire class, it is possible that they might get a little uh, bold and they might choose to try and turn off their camera or they might choose to uh, not be present uh, or whatever it might be, not be engaged because they think you're not paying attention. So really at the end of the day is you're really ensuring that the people not only are who they say they are, but they're there for the duration of the time. There's some flexibility in that. I recommend you're on for most of the time. Uh, just because your presence really helps to ensure that people understand that, oh, wait, there's somebody watching me to ensure that I'm there. I, I think it's a good idea. Are you, do you have to be there the entire time? No, I'm not there in an in-person class the entire time, but I need to make sure that my presence is known. So I'm going to be popping in frequently and communicating frequently. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, so if the proctor is a student as well, they will get credit for the class, right? They can. Keep in mind, that is a fine line that I'd have to be very careful with. Because if you have somebody getting a personal benefit and then also managing everybody else, it's kind of like whenever you, you're in elementary school and the teacher steps out for a minute and chooses her favorite teacher or favorite student to then monitor the class while they're out because the teacher had to go to the bathroom or something. That person is hated by everybody else before it's all said and done. And so it's a fine line. You know, can it happen? Yes, it can happen. It might not be the best use of your resources by offering credit and uh, uh, making them the, the proctor and they're helping manage other people as well. Can it work? Yes, but just be mindful of the implications. That's our biggest concern. Be mindful of the implications. Right. Um, there was a question of whether they need to sign the proctor policies from the website because the course policy signature page is, is posted. Um, yeah. So the answer to that is no, because the co-sponsorship is what you sign. Correct. So the, the proctor themselves don't have to sign it. There are proctor policies or their course of policies even. Uh, so the, I think what I understand you're saying is there is an example of our course policies in the proctor policies. And that is something that's simply an example, or it's actually in all of our qualifying courses across the board, the exact same document is there. It is expected, regardless of whether you show them or not, it is expected that they're gonna comply with those policies or whether they sign it or not, it doesn't really matter. But according to the Real Estate Commission, you're required to make sure that they see those policies before they register for the course. They don't have to sign it, but they have to see it. So my recommendation is if you have online or whatever it might be, you just need to make sure that they see and acknowledge it. Or alternatively, when the class begins, uh, you can administratively show the proctor pol or course policies and address a line item, a couple of items on there that are key issues and say, by virtue of you staying in this class, you are now agreeing to these terms. If you have any questions, you can speak to me outside of this class instance uh, during a break and we can address it at that time. But acknowledgement is something that they have to be, they, you have to make sure that they've acknowledged it before the class begins. And it has stuff in there like makeup revisions, uh, what is dropped, what is a passing grade, uh, attendance records, what is uh, expected of completed attendance. So it's important that they see that 
before they actually register for the course and definitely before the class begins. But you don't have to sign it. All right, uh, switching gears to the advertising and submitting samples of advertising. So can you clarify how that process is done, how often it needs to be done, and what needs to be included? Yes. You, so simply, we need one sample of your advertising before you offer your first course on January 1st or thereof after. And it is only one time, and that's all we need. We just want to make sure you understand what the rules are and that you're implementing them. Because really, if you're doing it at the point of registration, everything else that goes out is really probably going to be fine. It's at the point of registration that we really care about, that we want to make sure that these five things are there, the provider name, provider number, course name, course, course number, and the refund cancellation policy. Those five things are what we're looking for at the point of registration. That's it. So once you show us that, then we're good. And we only need to see it one time. We might ask for it again next year, this time as we're going into a new co-sponsorship agreement. It's always good to circle back and make sure that we're all on the same page. Maybe the rules change, we don't know. And so we will likely ask for it year over year, but once you show us one time, then during the duration of the agreement, the co-sponsorship agreement, you're fine unless you change something. And then, yeah, let us know. Uh, we want to look at it to make sure that we're okay and that we're all, everything's fine. The teacher cross and not your daughter. Um, okay, and they should send it to us via email? Yeah. Yeah, you can send it to us. So keep in mind, we're talking about something that does not exist yet because we still haven't actually disseminated the co-sponsorship agreement. So we're ahead of the game right now, preparing you for some of the changes that you can look for in the agreement. In addition to that, we're going to send it through DocuSign for you guys to sign. But we're also going to send you an email saying, hey, by the way, we sent you a co-sponsorship agreement. You know, so let us know if you didn't get it. And also go ahead and email, reply back to this email with your uh, advertising so we can take a look at it. So you can send it now, you can send it later, whatever it might be, but we're going to be on the lookout for it. And we will let you know more details as to where you need to send what uh, you haven't gotten it going forward. So it, you don't have to remember all this right now. We're just trying to prep you for what's coming. Can you give some examples of refund or an example of what refund cancellation policy language would look like in the advertising? Yeah, so we actually have uh, template registration forms on our website. So when you go to the course administration page, uh, there's actually template registration forms and every single one of those has a template refund cancellation policy. And so you're welcome to copy and paste that or edit it however you want. Uh, usually, I mean, the whole premise behind it from my perspective is you want to make sure that you're not, uh, if you do any work for the class, that you are safeguarded, uh, that you're actually getting compensated for that, and that not everybody's dropping off the day of the course, and you've spent all this time, effort, and energy, and lining up all these sponsors to come in with snacks and food and stuff like that, and then no one shows up. Uh, that's a good waste of time. And so if you can uh, save yourself and put in a refund cancellation policy of something like two business days before the course, you get a full refund, anything after that, $10 off, $50 off, $1,000, whatever you want to put. Uh, you know, it, you, 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 the whole premise behind it is really to help them understand when they can get their money back if they're going to. But also, I would use it as I don't want to waste my time. And so if you want to cancel, that's fine. But if I've started doing work for this class and, I, and I've incurred a cost or I've incurred time, then I'm going to actually ask for that money back. Or maybe I need to have the instructor on the hook, you know, by a certain time, then that might be a time factor as well or cost factor. So I would recommend using the template registration form uh, uh, verbiage. Uh, just to use as a premise and then you uh, adjust it however you need to for your needs at your association or site. Sorry, just going through questions. Yeah. I just saw there are 36 chats since the last time I checked, so we might be here a while. Uh, oh, you're okay. There's, there's actually not that um, many um, that we haven't already done. Um, so I think we're switching gears a little bit. Yeah, just to the co-sponsorship agreement in total. So we had one question of, does a new co-sponsorship agreement need to be signed and when? And then um, a clarification for someone who is a newer instructor, um, is an instructor considered a co-sponsor? Great questions. Let's start with the first one. We are going to send out new co-sponsorship agreements that will go into effect January 1st of 2021. Our goal is to send it in the next two weeks. Our legal department is currently reviewing it uh, to make sure of accuracy and safeguarding and what have you. Once we have it, we will send it out the next couple of weeks. 
you have until January 1st or your first class to sign it. We need one in hand before your first class on or after January 1st of 2021. In addition to that, we will need your advertising sample before your first class as well. So those two things need to be in our hands, ultimately, I mean, preferably before January 1st, but ultimately before uh, the first class of 2021. If you're an instructor, you do have the ability to also sign a co-sponsorship agreement. You can technically offer classes outside of a local association, but I would highly recommend working with your local association more times than not because they're great course administrators. They're great at already proctoring things and they have a ready-made audience for marketing purposes. They have a great schedule. Uh, it's easier in the grand scheme of things. You don't have to worry about all the stuff we just talked about. You get to be the talent, walk in, teach, walk out. And so uh, there's a lot of benefits to working with associations. Uh, if for some reason an association doesn't hire you, then that is an option. But the, the best option, in my opinion, is to continue to work with local associations. Can you um, def just kind of define a role what co-sponsor means? Yes. We're cooperatively sponsoring a course is the easiest way I can say it. That we, as a provider, have rules that we have to comply with with the Real Estate Commission on course logistics and administration. And we have our own rules too. And we partner with a co-sponsoring entity to do course administration for classes. We do some things and you do some things. And so that's ultimately what a co-sponsorship agreement is, is a partnership between two entities for course administration purposes to ensure that the Real Estate Commission is compliant or any other entity for that matter. Like let's say it's an NER course or another entity course. We wanna make sure that all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. We do certain things, but at the end of the day, there's six of us and we process 45,000 records in a year. If we did, were to offer or go to all of the classes that we offer, we, we would have gray hair in about 10 minutes. And so we need to partner with you guys to continue to offer courses. So that's the whole premise. This is the partnership of course administration. We probably have time for maybe one more and then we need to move to the instructor. Um, just a note, um, I just pulled up the CE course registration form and there isn't any language there for refund and cancellation policy. It's just a space to fill it in. So we will. Um, yeah, I'll give it to you. We we'll use it. I'll, yeah. I'll make sure to send it out, and we'll put it into the next uh, Education Insider, so that way you guys have access to it and you can see this is a template option that you have. Um, and then if you ever want to just send us one, we can also let you know as well. Like if you want to take a stab at it, we'll we happy to take a look at it as well. I'm sorry, it used to be there. I don't know why it isn't. So. And that's it. Good, good, good. Yay! So the next thing we're going to talk about is what it, it means to be an instructor. So really, we talked about co-sponsoring as course administration, and then the instructor agreement is simply that we have expectations for you as the talent that's going to be coming in and sharing your expertise uh, with participants through our provider that the, we have certain expectations from you as well. Um, with those, it is, I have to scroll, hold on a second. I do have notes, I hate to say it, but I'm getting old and I can't remember things anymore. Um, so to be an instructor through Texas Realtors, you have to actually be approved by Texas Realtors. So there's an application process for you guys to be here. You've already done it, so you're good to go. Um, but you also have a current instructor agreement. Those go year over year, January 1st to December 31st. So just like the co-sponsorship agreement, we're in the process of sending that one out as well. And so we do need to have a current instructor agreement. Uh, it says basically the same thing year over year. Uh, we don't really change a whole lot. At the end of the day, when you're teaching a class, as an independent contractor through our provider, you're gonna have our hat as our ambassador on during the context of the course. You're not gonna be marketing or recruiting yourself uh, or your brokerage or anything like that. You're not going to uh, endorse any other entity except for a sub entity like a local association you might be working for. You 100% can do that uh, because you're working there. Um, but other than that, it's basically what hat you're wearing. Uh, we want you to act professionally. Uh, to teach the course in alignment with the class objectives and the timed outline and provided materials, if there are any. You know, basically follow what we provide to you. If we provide it, we expect you to follow it. Um, we don't want you to promote other entities besides the co-sponsor that contracted you. Uh, we don't want you to recruit. Uh, we want you to follow the course objectives and prescribed, uh, prescribed start time, end time, and breaks as identified by the co-sponsoring entity. So they're the ones schedule the class and you're gonna follow their rules. And so if they say it's a 10 minute break every hour, it's a 10 minute break every hour. You don't get to adjust that. That's their call, not yours. And so you need to make sure that you're following whatever they say uh, as far as the course logistics are concerned, which also means you defer to the co-sponsor for course logistics. 
if somebody says, hey, I need to be late to a class, is that okay? Your answer is you need to go talk to the co-sponsoring entity. Uh, they're the ones that are in charge of course logistics. You get to be the talent and walk in and teach. Um, if there's anything you see, Aaron, uh, as far as content or a normal class circumstances, we want you to know, to let us know, instructors. Just like with that normal course logistics, uh, co-sponsors, we want you to let us know as well. Uh, these are things that have been in there for forever as far as the instructor agreement. It's really not that much new. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, address a couple of things really fast on what it means to be, uh, or the changes in the instructor agreement. So if you can bear with me, I'm gonna share my slide again. And so here's a couple of things. Um, the term recruit is the most specifically ambiguous term I think I've seen in the Real Estate Commission rules uh, because even they don't define it. Um, and so this is how we define it. Recruiting means you're actively engaging in trying to get people to move to your brokerage. Um, that's how we define recruiting. Uh, that does not mean that uh, you can't have an email address with your domain in it. That does not mean that if you can use or if you need to use something for instructional purposes and you do have something as your own, like a website or Facebook page, you can use your information. Uh, we don't recommend it if you can get away with it. Uh, it's just easier because there is an evaluation line that will ding you if they perceive that you're recruiting. So even if you're not intending to, they could perceive it. So be careful with that. But technically, if you're using it for educational purposes and you're demonstrating from your own experience right here on this Facebook page or website or whatever, for compliance with TREC rules or uh, the realtor rules on uh, the Article 12, then that's okay, you can do it, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. I'd be very careful uh, with that. In addition to that, as an instructor, I'd also make sure that you're talking to your co-sponsoring entity because again, we have our rules, which are the minimum expectation across all of Texas, but if you're working with an association, they might have additional rules on top of that. We do that all the time. Uh, NAR courses that we offer, they have a minimum expectation and we say, those are great, but this is how Texas operates. And we had additional rules and criteria on top of that as well. So the most important thing is just to continue to communicate co sponsors to your instructors, and instructors to your co sponsors to set clear expectations so that way everybody's set up for success. But technically the term recruit means that you have to be actively engaged in trying to get people to move to your brokerage. That's really how it's defined. And then the other new uh, change is the no promotion of other entities besides the co-sponsor of the contract to do for that class. So we fully recognize that you're technically under our provider. And if you want to tell people of other classes through our provider, um, then we are, we can be okay with that. I mean, technically it's our stuff, but if you have another hat on, like you're working at a local association and they're co-sponsoring with you, then don't tell them about other association classes unless they say it's okay. Uh, so you can ask them, and especially if they're not planning to offer the course, then that's a possibility. But you need to make sure that they're okay with you doing that before you do it. Just sending them the clear expectations and communicating ahead of time is key. Uh, just make sure you're wearing uh, the hat appropriately that you have on at that time. That's really what that, that uh, line means. Uh, know who you're working with and who you're working for uh, during the context of the class. That is really, the instructors, it's pretty simple. Just don't do stupid stuff. And so uh, professionally, and wear your hat well and do teach the course the way you're supposed to. It's pretty simple. Um, but with that, we fully recognize there might be questions. And so what kind of questions might we have this time? A couple about recruiting. So um, one is, must the instructor voice a disclaimer prior to visiting their social media pages? Yes, that is in your best interest. Whether it's a rule or not, if you don't do that, then they're going to deem you on that evaluation. We've seen it too many times. So you want to make sure you're saying, I'm only showing this to you for demonstration purposes. So you can see as part of this class that this is what we're trying to accomplish. And this is how I did it wrong, or this is ways in, that you can actually do it in whatever way. You need to put that disclaimer. It is in your best interest. And then, um, if you introduce your, the other classes that you will be teaching, is that okay? If it is not at the association in which you are teaching, you need to ask that association because you're wearing their hat as the uh, working for them for that class. Uh, and then what about AEs that try to get instructors to change their board of choice? Is that recruiting? It's not happening during the context of the course. So that's not defined as recruiting as far as education is concerned. Education is before, during, after course for that specific instance. And so uh, an A trying to get an instructor to change, that's, that's 
a whole different conversation and not for education. And then um, this is different, a different topic. So now that Trek requires a timed outline for CE courses, how will those be distributed to instructors ahead of time to develop the material? Great question. Um, we're working on that is the easy answer. The, the short answer is we do have some timed outlines. And as we continue to get timed outlines with new courses, we are posting them on our website. So when you go to the instructor search and you pull up a specific class, at the very bottom of the class, it actually says timed outline and it's a hyperlink. You can click on it to see the timed outline for the courses of, of, that we have timed outlines for at this time. And then we had the one question um, from earlier. So when it comes to instructor evaluations, there's an instructor that gets negative comments. When does Texas Realtors need to be involved in the conversation about their teaching? So technically there's two, two possibilities. One is when an instructor falls below 4.0. Systematically and numerically, that overrides everything. If you uh, reach below a 4.0, then we're going to step in and have a conversation with you to figure out what's going on, what happened, how can we help you succeed going forward, what steps do we need to address to, to help you make sure that you're ready to go next time. That's number one. Number two is if the instructor does not comply with the instructor agreements, we need to know. And so the instructor agreement, I believe, is also, isn't it also posted on our course administration page, Shiloh? I think it is. And so if it isn't, we'll make sure it is. Um, but if you see something in the instructor agreement that they are not complying with, then yes, we also need to know that as well. Um, and specifically, in all reality, we really need to know just between you guys and us, it really matters if it's written documentation or recording. If it's he said, she said, it's really hard to enforce anything. And so it's really important that it's either recorded or written documentation of sorts to clearly indicate or a third party, third neutral party. So, okay, so that way we can clearly say, okay, this is in violation with our instructor agreement. We need to address this because we wanna make sure that we're in compliance. And equally so on the exact opposite end, if for some reason an instructor identifies an association not in compliance with the co-sponsorship agreement, which is also on our course administration page, we need to know that too. Um, not that we want you guys to tattle or call each other out, but it's in everyone's best interest with one provider that we make sure that we're all on the same page and we're consistent in the way that we offer courses and we want to make sure we have the same level of expectation for our co-sponsor entities and our instructors alike, regardless of where they're teaching from or for. You muted. Um, oh, okay. So we have another question about um, recruiting. Uh, can an instructor bring in a vendor affiliate, a vendor or affiliate to make a presentation during a class, whether it is in context of the class or not? Ooh, okay. So there's a couple things with that. Well, if an instructor is going to bring somebody in as part of the class, they need to notify the association or co-sponsoring entity. They need to know what's going on uh, just to make sure that there's no um, conflict of interest, that they just need to be aware. And so can they bring in somebody like a guest speaker? Yes, they can bring in somebody. Um, if the person has nothing to do with the context of the course, no, it needs to be about the class. The instructor does not need to bring in their own sponsoring people of sorts. It needs to be about the context of the course. The instructor, under the instructor agreement handles teaching the class. The co-sponsorship agreement handles the course logistics. So yes, you can bring somebody in, but you need to make sure that you let the co-sponsorship agreement, co-sponsoring entity know, and they have to be about the class. And so for instance, if you're talking about uh, mortgage lending and you wanna bring in a mortgage lender, that makes perfect sense. If you wanna bring in a roofer, that's a problem because that has nothing to do with mortgage lending. And so you need to make sure that they're, uh, they, they're relevant to the content because otherwise that's about promoting products and services that are not directly in line with the course and that is a specific evaluation question. So speaking of evaluations, um, we have an instructor who asked how do instructors receive copies of their evaluations? That's a good question. The you're supposed to be receiving those in a relatively quick fashion. We recognize that there have been some that have not been going out. Uh, they should be going out effective August. Any class that has occurred since August, between August 1st and August 26th, you should have your evaluation. If 
you don't have it, you need to let us know. If you have a question about a specific class, let us know and we can work on trying to get you that information. But you should be receiving, it, the instructor should be receiving the evaluation and uh, the co-sponsoring entity should also be receiving a copy of it as well. So we, everybody sees the evaluations and the comments. And then um, back to, well, one question about evaluations. Um, can GRI evaluations be found online? And the answer to that question is yes, they can. The blank, well, the, the links to the forms can, are found on the course administration page. And then the it, other, can, I, can I add to that really quick? Ahead. So we have 13 evaluations. One of them is an evaluation for everything except GRI. And then we have 12 for GRI. And the reason why is because it's almost impossible to keep track of which evaluation for each day and every instructor gets evaluated for each day of the GRI. So it is really important you make sure that you're using the right link for the right day so we can find it and we can make sure and give the right person the, the credit for the evaluation. In addition to that, I would also recommend maybe encouraging people by giving them, it, it expects a process of you receiving the evaluation and the instructor receiving the evaluation. If either the instructor or the co-sponsoring entity can actually predefine for the people saying, hey, when you get this evaluation, put this information in for the instructor name or for the date or for the class. Because in that way, it's a lot easier for us to sort and be able to get it out to you. We're not trying to find a needle in a stack of needles. And so it's a lot easier to find and be able to get it out to you. So if you want to preemptively tell them that information, that is a great idea. So please make sure you do that. Okay, that was it, sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. No, um, then, Oh yeah, okay. So, and these are questions about um, guests to the class. So the first is, is the co-sponsor able to require approval of guest speakers or sponsors? Yes. Did. So related to that is, can a third party provide lunch for a class and give materials to students? Yes, to both. However, that is all with the co-sponsoring entity. The co-sponsoring entity, the one who signed the co-sponsorship agreement, is the one who is in charge of potential sponsors and people bringing in uh, something during lunch. And the whole reason why they're allowed to bring it in during lunch, as long as it's not a working lunch, is because it's not during the context of the course. And so if they're bringing in lunch and they want to provide it, that's fine because that means that the participant doesn't have to sit there. They can get up and leave. They don't have to listen to the person. And so that's the whole premise behind why it's allowed during lunch, as long as it's not during class time. It cannot be during class time at all. And yes, the co-sponsorship or co-sponsoring entity can require that any guest speaker of any capacity is ran and vetted through the co-sponsoring entity before the instructor allows it to occur. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, they're handling the course logistics. And I can say we as a co-sponsoring entity would want to know if somebody is coming in, who it is and why, uh, because we don't want to be blindsided. It's just a professional courtesy, uh, just to make sure that we know and we're not surprised. So when somebody said, hey, when Shiloh came in to teach the, you know, part of this class, we're not surprised and saying, wait, why was Shiloh there? Um, so it's, it's, yes, please make sure that you're telling uh, the co-sponsoring entity what you're doing and when and where and why, and make sure they're okay with it. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to be fine with it, but they just, they, they just need to know. It's a really good idea for them to know. And that is all the questions I have. What? <laughs> that is unreal. All right. So, um, Deb, do you have any other comments that we need to address, or do we not catch anything? No, I was just watching watching the uh, the the comments questions come flying in, and great great job of relaying all those. That um, the instructors have got you know questions about what do we do about uh, monitors that aren't doing their job? How do we handle that? And the best advice I would give is because I'm sure that more than one person has that question, it's just to reach out to us so we can handle it and on your first break, if that's necessary, you know, so we can make sure that uh, what's supposed to be happening is happening. It, just really quick in alignment with that, just to be clear, try to reach out to the monitor first and monitors try to reach out to the instructor first. It could be a simple misunderstanding. And so, you know, just set those clear expectations. And if it is consistent or if it is continued, then yeah, let us know. You know, it's possible that it could be a misunderstanding or it was an accident or something could have happened or maybe the instructor didn't know, the monitor didn't know, who knows. You know, it's okay to seek to understand the, with the first question. 
if it happens again, and it's obviously not in alignment with what we expect, um, either the instructor or coach on your side, side, yeah, that exactly. You know, please let us know because we is our providers at stake if we don't follow the rules. And that's really the reason why we put all this information in a document to send to you guys is so that we all know what is expected of us because if we don't follow the rules, then we have a problem. And I, I think one of the other things that I want to make sure that we reinforce is I don't remember you talking about this is the whole part about that the student must be on camera the entire time. You know, that they have to be participating in the class. And so we have, we've had a lot of them that are not on camera. Um, if they don't have adequate, you know, internet to be able to participate, then they probably should go somewhere where they, where they can, you know, but um, it's just not a practice that we can continue to, to tolerate on any level. And so I just want to make sure that that's clear. And one thing we actually, and in alignment with that, good point, Deb, uh, is that whenever we have these additional criteria or responsibilities or anything else, like we have our minimum expectations and those are posted on our website. But another place to get feedback or collaborate with other entities is to look into the Facebook group for association staff or even for instructors uh, to see what monitor guidelines are out there for each association because some of them have some really good ones. Uh, maybe some things don't always apply to your association, but a lot of them are really, really good. And so I'd recommend you know, reaching out uh, to take a look. I did see one really quick. Uh, so Megan said, uh, not every association is providing uh, monitors, co-host capabilities. Uh, so we see that and it's something we are going to address in that one document about broadcast monitor guidelines. Uh, one, there are going to be guidelines. We're going to change that, their expectations. Uh, but then two, uh, we are going to clearly communicate what is expected and we're going to make sure that instructors know that and monitors of those classes know it as well. Because those are ones where when we're all together, we all need to be acting and operating the same. And instructors need to know what they're walking into and what you guys are expecting as co-hosts or as co-monitors of the proctors of the course. But equally so, that uh, you guys need to know what, what did we expect, that and also what you can expect of each other and also the instructor during those times as well. So we are addressing that. That is next on our list. And we will make sure it's addressed before we send out the co-sponsors. Someone asked a question about how do we find monitors? Um, Assuming that they're talking interchangeably about proctors, then it would either be the local association or someone similar to that. Yeah, um, I, I actually recommend, I mean, if you can swing this, uh, you can actually get a fellow instructor. Um, that way they can be there together and especially if they're interested in your content or interested in monitoring or auditing your delivery style anyway. You know, they have a vested interest in being there. They don't need the CE credit, but they get a chance to, you know, see how you teach. And so you guys can, you know, piggyback off of each other um, and you can, uh, they can serve as a monitor in that capacity. I mean, I, I'm not saying you have to do that. It's just an idea. Uh, we have indicated before that you can use students. Um, I always be recommended. It is a possibility. But as Deb said, the best option is to work with the local associations. Because then when you do, that's their job. They find the monitors for you. Or they're the monitors themselves. And so... You just get to walk in and teach. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. I know I've seen a couple of chat messages come up and I can't read that fast. They just come and go so quick. Uh, someone wanted to know if we're going to save this chat. Um, we don't really have a good way to get that out, um, but we will we'll recap major points in, when we, in future insiders and in the Facebook groups. Um, I did, just so you know, I, I just sent out in the chat links to the, to the Facebook groups. They are specific. So if you are an instructor, you are welcome in the instructor's Facebook group and not the association staff and vice versa. If you are an association staff, you are, we encourage you to join the, um, the education staff uh, instructor, or sorry, the education staff words are hard. Education, staff, Facebook group. I just see one question. I'll, I'll address that really quick from Gabriella. As far as the recommended place for instructors to be able to teach from, 
I think that uh, we don't want to limit it because really at the end of the day, the strong internet connection and the good quality sound is optimal. In fact, Marky Women's actually said the best places she ever has ever taught a class is actually inside her car while driving, but sitting in her car because the acoustics were best and the sound and the lighting was optimal. So she sits in her car to teach classes all the time. Uh, I'm sure it's hot, but you know, that's an option. So we don't want to limit people necessarily. The only requirement that we have on our side is that the, uh, uh, the internet connection is strong if you're teaching remotely and that your sound and your uh, video are adequate uh, for the class to make sure that it is an optimal experience. I mean, I can tell you that if you're sitting at a beach and you truly are sitting at a beach, um, maybe that's not the best thing you want to promote while you're teaching a course because there is a level of professionalism that you're trying to convey as an instructor. Uh, it's just the best practice, but as a local association, you do have the ability to put in additional criteria for members, instructors, monitors, whatever it might be. So I know some associations don't allow uh, virtual backgrounds. And so you can allow or not allow a virtual background for an instructor or an expectation of what you want to see of them when it comes to uh, where they're teaching from. There's a really good question that Rhonda just asked. Do you have to be able to see your students while teaching? And the answer is you have to be able to at least see them at some point. I mean, sometimes you're going to have multiple screens and it's not always handy to click through all that. That's one of the things that the monitor is doing is, is helping to um, manage that. But you should be able to see however many students are on your screen while you're teaching. I think maybe a, another way of saying it is you don't have to see them, but they have to be seen. And so you know, if there's 500 people in a class, it's not necessarily expected that the instructor is scrolling through every single screen to see every single person. If you're in an auditorium of 10,000 people making a presentation, you're not going to be able to see every single face. However, the proctors, that's their job, is to make sure that they're seen and they're attentive. Now, granted, if you have a, a very uh, communicative class, one that you're trying to get case studies or town halls and things like that, then you're going to want to see everybody. You know, you're going to want to make sure that you're able to scroll through. It's an optimal situation. And so that's something that that's if that's where you're the way you're trying to disseminate the information, then that's what you're going to need. If it is a one hour CE course that is a fire hose of information that you're not going to ask questions or ask them to break out into groups, then technically you don't necessarily have to see them, but they have to be seen. They have to be on camera. That's a rule. And your proctor is going to be keeping an eye on it because there's over 20 people in the class. And so they're 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 required to go through and make sure that they're seen. And as far as um, Rhonda had a follow up that uh, if you're in your car, how can you see them. Um, you would have to have some type of mechanism in your car where you can see the students. I mean that that either an iPad or your laptop or whatever. I'm not quite yeah. sure. And, and we're not requiring people to teach in their cars for the record. Like that's, that's not our expectation. If you know it's working, please continue to do that system. You know, they need to be seen, the people need to be seen, and you need to be adequately seen and heard as the instructor. You're the host, you have to be heard well, you need to be seen well. And so whatever that works for you, and if you can figure out a way to make it work in your car, or on top of your roof, or in the pool, whatever you want to do, that's fine. But just keep in mind that, you know, it needs to be a, a level of professionalism that you're expecting of your participants, that that's what you need to disseminate from what you're doing, or where you're teaching from. I think we're all trying to read. <laughs> I don't think yeah. any, there haven't been really any other questions that have come in um, other than that maybe um, we're talking about participants having a dark face, like a, well, well, bad lighting. And so they just, you just see a dark screen instead of faces. So encouraging lighting behind your, your camera and windows closed behind you. My, my first goal is just to get everybody on camera, you know, where they actually are on camera. Um, and then we can talk about details as far as how much lighting they need to have and all that. But our first goal is just to get everybody on camera. You know, if we can achieve that, that would be um, a great achievement. And that's it. All right. Well, it just so happened to the 159, so that works out. I know somebody did ask 
Uh, it, it, can you get the chat? The answer is, I don't think so. We can, we're not smart enough to figure that out. But what we do have is a recorded session. And we will make sure and disseminate the recorded session to you guys going forward. In addition to that, most importantly, we're always around. And so if you need something, please feel free to reach out to us. That's why we're here. We're here to support you guys in offering quality education throughout Texas. We appreciate your partnership. We are thankful for what you do as instructors and also as co-sponsoring entities. Uh, we thank you for helping us make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, we really appreciate your time and hopefully you found valuable information in this and that we can continue to move forward. Uh, be on the lookout for your co-sponsorship agreement. Uh, people are going to sign them and also your instructor agreement. Uh, people are going to sign those and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah. I just wanted to add that um, we are compiling all these questions and Shiloh's creating a FAQ. So, you know, if there is questions that we will have that part anyway, so you really don't need the chat because we're going to filter it all and edit it for you. So it'll be in FAQs. Wonderful. That's exciting. It's and thank good. you everybody for participating. Great questions, great comments. And um, like John said, we're all available. You know, our office lines are ringing wherever we are. So you can call our office lines and we'll be there. Well, with that, I think we're good. So y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Recording?